Welcome to the channel Grand Columbia. My name is Lauren Lau. This is November 2023. In case time causes information to be stale. And this is part two in the series Relocating to Armenia, Colombia. Hope you enjoyed the first one. A lot of information. My format's a little scattered, but uh, should get you through. And at the end of today's video, as a matter of fact, at the end of all three parts, if you're interested, you'll find a little promotional video, horribly done, I might add, of myself offering a relocation service. Okay, so today we're going to do the big move. It's time to get on that airplane. So what are we going to do? First thing is don't forget to make sure you've canceled all your subscriptions, any services that you had. You don't want those things to be outstanding. Um, as you're getting on the airplane because doing things from another country can be problematic. Second of all, make sure that you've settled your banking issue, particularly those that are retired. The best way, again, I won't go into detail on this, I've covered it many times, but you don't really want to, uh, at first anyway, have your retirement funds directed to some bank in Colombia, hold off on banking, you know, for at least a year or two, do it from a U.S. bank. All you have to do is walk up to the ATM, pull out what you need. The banks that I'm going to advise is either Capital One. It's the account called 360. There's no fees, no cost, and no cost to use it on this end. And the other one is Charles Schwab account. Now, a lot of people rave about that. I actually tried to get it some years ago. I had all kinds of problems and delays. I put a $50 deposit down as they asked. Uh, when I finally couldn't get the thing rolling, they refused to give me back my $50. I'm not a fan, but Capital One has been flawless. I've been using it in South America for almost nine years. <clears throat> so make sure you have your bank chosen and a debit card. I recommend those two because certain banks, such as uh, Chase, for example, good bank. Tends to be intermittently problematic here as you're trying to use the ATM. And I could go through a whole series of banks. I don't know what the issue is, but what I do know, Capital One is flawless. Okay, so you got your bank set up and you got your debit card. Now do your last check to make sure that you have all the documents that you were supposed to have, your apostilles, whatever. Make sure you have all that together. Make sure you got your passport. You didn't lose it. Don't put your passport in the storage luggage. Make sure it's in your carry-on. <clears throat> and make sure your luggage is all ready to go and you have everything packed that you wanted and you, you needed. Number four here, confirm your temporary housing. Now, when you get temporary housing, that could be a hotel. It could be an Airbnb. Uh, if you're working with me, I'll help you choose before you come down because I know the locations. I know where they are. Um, so I'll just send you a link of five or six to choose from in whatever price range you told me. Don't get them for extended period, even though you might need something like that for up to a month. What you want to do is maybe get a week and then extend it or find another one. The reason being is things like that here are not the same as where you are. There's not necessarily good quality control. There can be issues. Maybe there's a lot of noise. Who knows? Um, I'll give you good recommendations of locations, but in particular, whatever floats your boat might be an issue in that particular one. So leave the door open to make a change so you're not locked in, because if you reserve it for two weeks, you're going to be paying for two weeks. It's, it's, it's more difficult to try to, okay, you didn't do this, this, and this, so I'm leaving here after three days, and eh, too bad, you know, you're... You're here now. Uh, so confirm that you did your temporary housing and you really want to set it up for maybe a week, two weeks at the outside. Okay, so you're on your airplane. You've, you've done your check MIG. That's like your declaration statement. It's online, check MIG for Columbia. You can look it up. Um, a lot of these details are talked about elsewhere. So you're on your airplane. You got your passport. You're good to go and you're flying in. When you get to the airport, you're going to have to go through immigration. Be patient. Don't assume anything. Don't assume you're being ignored, whatever. It's likely to take some time. Typically, it might be 15 minutes to a half an hour. 
It can take an hour to an hour and a half. You never know. So just be patient. And if you're moving here, it's the last time you'll have to do it. Or maybe. Uh, let me talk about where you fly into. Choice of airport. If you fly into Armenia, it's, it's quick and easy. I suggest to do that. We've got different flight options now. You've got Avianca, you've got Copa, you've got Spirit. Uh, there's some new ones coming online. Um, Copa will fly to Panama City and then come on here with a short delay. So you fly to Armenia and it's very simple. Now, what other options would you have? Well, you could fly into Pereira. And a lot of people might say, it's better to fly into Pereira. You know, you got more flight options, you get American Airlines and all of that. It isn't necessarily better because the airport is on the other side of Pareto. It's, it's, there's a distance. You've got quite a ways to go to get to the bus terminal. Taxis to Armenia, it's, it's a lot of money. So you don't really want to do that. You get off the airport at Pareto, you go through immigration, you get in a taxi, you go to the bus terminal. Now you're going to get a bus to Armenia. And once you get to the Armenia bus terminal, you're going to get a taxi there, and you're going to then go to where you're going to be staying. It's all problematic because that ordeal can take two, three hours. You fly into Armenia, you get through immigration, and the taxi ride, uh, which is right outside the door, and it's going to cost you maybe 10 or $15. It'll have you to your hotel or wherever you're staying in about 20 minutes. It's much simpler. And if you don't want to take a taxi in Armenia, there's buses, there's bus stops right there. If you understand the bus routes, you jump on one of those and you come in to Armenia that way. Um, that'll just cost you a couple dollars. I suggest taking a taxi on your first one, door-to-door -door service, make it simple. And then the third option is you fly to Bogota first, go through immigration, then fly into Armenia. That usually requires an overnight stay. You're not really saving anything. Some people will do that because, they, well, it's a more convenient flight and I didn't have to do an exchange in the United States. I could fly directly to Bogota. Yeah, but then you're doing an exchange here. And if you're going to do an exchange, would you rather do it in airports that you're familiar with and you speak the same language? Or do you want to do an exchange where that's not necessarily the case? Given the choice, fly to Armenia. Second choice, fly to Pareda. Last choice, if you don't have any other option, fly to Bogota and then on to Armenia. If you've hired me, I will meet you at the airport, either at Pareda or at the Armenia airport. So, you know, we'll be in contact. Um, you'll get a description of the car. You'll know basically where I'm waiting for you. And uh, you'll come out the door, you will throw your luggage in, and we'll head right to where you're going. Currency, what are you gonna do? Dollars don't really fly here. There's people that will take it, like their taxi, he'll, he'll take it. But you're gonna get screwed on the rate. It, the economy is in pesos, it's not in dollar. And uh, particularly here in Armenia, it's not really set up for that. Like you can't go into a store and say, well, here's dollars, you know, can you exchange it? I'm, you know, it, it, it's just problematic. So just bring enough in dollars for, I don't know, emergency snacks, something like that before you get to Columbia. I wouldn't have in dollars more than maybe 50 bucks. It just doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, you do whatever you want to do. It's just not necessary. When you get to the airport, no matter what the airport is, go to one of the ATMs and don't withdraw a lot of money but withdraw about $30 worth of Colombian pesos. That'll cover you to get in the taxi and go where you gotta go. If you're flying to Pareto, maybe pull out 50. So the ATM is, is the way to go in that situation. Now, the only recommended ATM I will tell you about is Davi Vienda. The bank is called Davi Vienda. Avoid Bank Columbia. If you have a Bank Columbia account, they're fine. But if you don't, you're going to pay fees. You're going to pay a penalty on the exchange rate. By the time you're done, $100, you might get $70 out of it. So you want to avoid that. And other banks are similar. But Davi Vienda, 
particularly if you're using Capital One or Schwab. There's no ATM fee and you get a choice. Do I take their recommended conversion? You always decline it. And then what you get is the actual conversion for that day. It's far superior. You'll save yourself a lot of money. There's no fees or penalties involved, particularly if you decline the exchange rate. They ask you about the exchange rate, which is very polite. And why are they asking? Well, because if you agree, which a lot of tourists that don't know any better, they'll agree because if you decline, they think you're declining the transaction. So if you agree, then you're agreeing to pay a couple hundred pesos for every dollar. You're giving them money unnecessarily. It's not a requirement. As such, they'll say, do you agree with this? Uh, no, decline. Then it defaults to the proper amount without them taking a cut and you get your money out. That's the way I do it every month. You can take 2 million per transaction. And if you need, you don't need a lot when you get here, but you maybe take out the 2 million, maybe 4 million tops, but you can do it another transaction, another transaction. Once a month, I go up to the ATM and I use the card three times in a row. Uh, six million, a little cash in my pocket. I pay various bills. It, it, it works like that. So it's very simple. And again, if I'm with you and I pick you up at the airport, one of the first stops we'll go to will be a Davi Vienda ATM. I'll walk you through how to use it. And then you'll also have money uh, for the hotel. Now the hotels um, probably will take credit card. Not necessarily. It's it was never a credit card society until the last handful of years. So a lot of places won't. But if they do, um, and if you go through booking.com, they usually will tell you if they do. But if they do and they ask you, do you want this in dollars and pesos? Always say pesos. Always say pesos. Always say pesos. Okay, you got your taxi, you went to the ATM, you're going to your hotel. Where is your temporary house? Well, the ideal would be somewhere near where you live maybe in central, most likely somewhere in the north part of Armenia. You want to make sure that you're in an area where you can actually get out and walk around uh, some of the places that you might choose to live. There's ATMs all over the place, so there's no need to carry a lot of cash. Uh, personally, I, in, unless I have something in particular to do, I don't really carry more than 200,000 pesos. That's about $50. That's about the max I'll carry. Um, you know, I've always got cards if I debit cards and things like that if I need, but um, there's no reason to carry in, in the potential of losing it somehow. Okay, so you've arrived, you're at your hotel. I very much recommend that you take a little time to kind of rest and recover. Even if you weren't that far away, it just kind of wears on you. In the next few days, you're going to be pretty active, you're going to be excited, you're going to want to go out there. You know, so you get to your hotel room, maybe um, unpack a little bit, not entirely, it's not permanent, maybe unpack a little bit, maybe check your emails and messages, take a shower, uh, change clothes, kick back, relax for a little bit, and then, you know, maybe go out the door, explore a little, but on the day of arrival, make it a free day, you know, if at all possible where you can just kind of walk the, the local area, see a cafe, something like that, and then sleep, get a good sleep for the night. And then if it's with me, I'll meet up with you and I'll start showing you around the barrios, things like that. If you're on your own, I would suggest you do the same. Choose some of the barrios and walk them if you can. You walk those barrios and get a sense of, would this be a good place for me to live? Is it near things? Um, if I'm giving you the tour, I'll explain. I'll recommend four different barrios. I'll take you through them. I'll explain why, what the characteristics of each one. You know, this one might be a little bit noisy, but it's got some nightclubs and discos and restaurants, and there's a lot of activity there. Might be what you're looking for. This one's more of a suburb type community. It's more quiet. It tends to be maybe older, more wealthier people there. I'll give you the nature of that, but you can discover that on your own. Okay, probably the second day, you wanna get your phone registered. I don't recommend buying a SIM card at the airport or off the street. They're there, convenient, 
dirt cheap, but you're going to be probably throwing it away anyway, because what you have to do is register your phone in Columbia. They say it's for theft. It doesn't stop theft. However, if you don't register it after it, using it for about a month or so, it'll lock up. Then you have to go to one of the phone companies and register your phone. But sometimes the unlock process can take a day or two. Usually it's within an hour or two, but it can take a day or two. For me, once it took two days. So be aware of that. I suggest on the day you arrive or the next day, depending on where you know your accommodations are, you go to Movistar, Claro, Claro, and Claro, and purchase yourself a SIM card and have the phone registered. They'll set it up for you right there. You'll pay a fee for the registry. It's a one-time thing, and it's not very much. It's maybe five or six dollar equivalent. Might be it might be sixteen, seventeen thousand pesos, but you'll have your SIM card. Initially, just to make it simple, just it just get a prepaid car and then you just put 20,000 pesos on it. It's probably going to be good for the month. Later, you can get a postpaid or just like a regular pay, a plan where you make a payment every month and you, you just have a month service. Again, if we meet up, I'll go into all the details about that. All these things I'll cover in detail with you, walk you through things, show you. Or if you're discovering it yourself, just take note of these things to make sure that you're doing these things. You don't want your phone locked up. Okay, so you know, you're know you on the next day and I mentioned walk the areas. So you definitely wanna walk the areas. And you're gonna be looking for a permanent place to live. Not necessarily that day. There's other things that you're gonna to have to go through, but it doesn't hurt to get started and get familiar with where you feel comfortable. So you walk a certain area. While you're doing it, you can look for signs in the window, places that are for rent. The word for rent is actually arienda. If you see a sign that says vende or venta, it's for sale. Um, that's not something you're gonna do. Even if ultimately you want to, you're not gonna do that in the first year. Take my advice on that. You're looking for a place to rent. It'll be generally a year contract. Keep your eyes open while you're out, you know, because it's gonna be important. So every chance that you're out, even if you're in a taxi and you see something, make a note, put it in your phone, snap a picture. Um, I used to um, take my phone and blow up the photograph and take a picture of the sign with a, with a phone number on it, and then I could refer to it later on my phone. I take one of the actual building and then the second one of the sign blown up. Like, oh, I remember that building. Oh, let me, let me, you don't necessarily call, but everybody uses the app WhatsApp and you can use uh, Google Translate and say, I saw your building, I see it's for rent. You know, what can you tell me? How many bedrooms? What's the square foot? Things like that. Okay, another thing that you can do on your first day of arrival is understand the peso. Kind of get it straight in your mind. After you're here for a while, you quit converting it. You know, I don't know how many months it takes, but you quit looking at it as dollars and, okay, what is that peso? I used to be able to convert like that. I was here long enough to where I had equal memory of the dollar versus peso. Now I, I have to think about it. I have to, because I'm all peso. I've been here dealing with pesos over five years. It's, it's the way I think. So if somebody says, what's that in dollars? Used to be instantaneously I knew. Now I got to stop and think about it. But understand the peso because there's a tendency to either undervalue or overvalue it in your mind. And it's important that you understand the value of it. What you see people do initially when they come here is maybe they'll go to a restaurant and they'll see these pesos that they just bought. And maybe they just bought 50 of them, but you got $250 and you got 200,000 pesos. And it's like, wow. For only fifty dollars, they got two hundred thousand. They go to a restaurant and they buy themselves lunch, and they start throwing money around. Oh, let me give you a big tip. Here it's a here's twenty thousand pesos tip, and it, because it doesn't seem like that much, but you're being crazy. That's that would be a ludicrous amount. That's not even a legal amount they could ever charge you. So it certainly isn't something you should be giving. And again, I go into tipping where it's appropriate, where it's not. It very often is not appropriate. Uh, sometimes it can even be an insult depending on the circumstance. 
So those are things, again, if you're with me, I'll teach you all those things. Or you can look back at my videos. Those are free. I've got several videos on tipping. I think I even did one within this last year as an update because things do change. It, it's important that you understand the value of the peso. And then what happens later is you start overvaluing it. You start getting really cheap with it. It's like, well, I gave him a thousand pesos. That should have been great. Yeah, but you should have given him 8,000 pesos. You know, you start becoming miserly because you're seeing those big numbers. This is a phase that most everybody goes through. So what I'm telling you, there's a reason for it. At first, you throw them around like they're candy. And then later, you treat it like you're, you know, King Midas and you're hoarding them. And you and you, you come across as a jerk because you don't even want to pay what you should be paying. The sooner you can understand the value objectively and so that when you get a price, you pay what you should pay or you're not throwing money around like you're trying to show off. And it, it's considered pretty crude here to do that, actually. And um, you won't get anybody. They'll be nice to you, but they'll just say, oh, kind of low class. Um, money isn't thing that, that good people really talk about very much. Understand the peso. It'll serve you well. Okay, now getting around town. You're going to walk. You can do a lot of walking. Uh, maybe you can't walk very much. Recently, I had problems with my foot, and I couldn't walk very much. So what do you, what do, you do? Well, you've got a couple choices in Armenia. You can take a taxi. You can go from one end of the city to the other end of the city for as much about the most I've ever seen is about 20,000 pesos. Most of my trips, like if I go to Central or whatever, it's going to cost me somewhere around the $2 mark, maybe $3. So it's very cheap. Your other option is their city buses. Now you need to know the bus lines, but they do have a sign up, but you will look at the sign and you won't really know what that means. So you won't really know where it's going. So, so at first the buses can be problematic. Now, again, you know, if you're connected with me, I can help you with that. Or better yet, I can get you with a local as your, your spirit animal, your local guide over the next month while you're getting a lot of details done. Because I only work with you for three days. After that, uh, you're on your own. Because the only thing I'm interested in getting with you is the transition. What's it like coming from North America, for example, or England and coming to Colombia in a different culture, different language, different society? And so I'm giving you the tools of how to make your best choices here, how to avoid mistakes. That's a big one. And how to settle in as soon as possible so you don't stand out like a sore thumb for doing the wrong thing. So that's what I spend my time. After that, I know local people that are relatively inexpensive that can work with you on a day-by-day -day basis. You buy them lunch, you give them 100,000 pesos, and they'll spend the day with you. It can be go to Salento on a day tour. It could be riding the buses and showing you the bus lines and showing you the taxis. It could be showing you best place to shopping. It can be helping you find furniture the kind of furniture and the price that you're looking for. Um, some of them are very good at negotiating prices. Now, there are, there are price tags on some things that are not negotiable. There's other things where prices are negotiable. Uh, used items, which I'm a fan of when it comes to like a refrigerator or a washing machine, things like that. I'm a big fan of getting used because you can get a quarter of the price. And they seem to last forever. I mean, my refrigerator that I got five years ago, I've changed it since then just because I wanted a, a bigger one with more features. But that refrigerator went to somebody else, and five years later, it's still working fine. I think it had three or four years on it when I got it. So, And, and I've got a washing machine that I've had now. Uh, four or five years. So used is a good way to go, but maybe you just want to have everything new. That's fine. But people can help you with that. So even if you're not using me, I can still give you a referral to somebody. 
Another thing when you arrive and you're working with me is I will give you a list. I'll email it to you or send it in a message that has a list of all kinds of things. It'll have uh, doctors and house cleaners and moving vans and whatever you can imagine you're probably going to need now and into the future. There'll be contacts, uh, dentists, uh, skin care, you know, various things like that, that either myself I've had good experiences with and I know it's on the up and up or close friends who have made recommendations for certain things that I can trust and rely on. I'll relay those to you because all businesses are not that great and you can kind of step in it. So, um, you know, I'll provide that. But even if we're not doing that, if you get here and you've watched my videos and you give me a heads up ham in town, do you have the phone number or the what's up number of anybody that can help me around with X, Y, Z? Um, I will certainly give you that. I don't have them do the, we'll call it the uh, indoctrination period of the first three days because locals don't know. They don't know what it's like to transition. They've been here their whole life. They don't, you know, they're not English speakers. They're, they're not coming from that culture. So they don't have a comparison. So they can't give you a heads up. Okay, watch out for this because of such and such. To them, it's just a normal thing and they won't know to point something out. All of that I, I do in the first three days. After that, I've, I've covered everything that's important. You don't need me anymore. I'm not gonna keep charging you. A local person then becomes the perfect option. Okay, now the next one, we're almost done on this video, is get the visa process started. Now you can get your visa taken care of when you're in the US. If you prepare for it, it's very simple to get it done here. You know, it, it's up to you. I waited until I got to where I, first I was in Ecuador, and then I came here and I took care of everything in Ecuador and here in Colombia. And I'm very comfortable with that. But if you're, doing your visa, you're still going to need your cedula, which means you're going to have to make an appointment. So you're going to have to figure out how to do that. But let's say that you're getting your visa here, um, you know, the way I did it and the way most people tend to do it. You've got to get the visa process started. You've got to get those documents to your visa agent. I do not recommend a visa attorney. Visa attorneys here and it's funny because in Ecuador, I, it was the exact opposite. I recommended attorneys, but it's a different situation there. So if you watch those old videos, it's not the same here. This is a different country. And here, visa attorneys, for the most part, don't know what the hell they're doing because they don't do this hardly ever do they do it. Now, the visa agent I have, I have no affiliation. I don't get any kickbacks. They're not even in my town. She's in Pareda. But here's the thing. When I came to Colombia, she came highly recommended by a friend of mine. And he told me his experience. It's like, oh, I want in on that. He was told by several other people who had the same experience. I went to see her. It was fantastic. I won't go into the detail, but it couldn't have been simpler. I, I barely had to lift a finger. I began to say, hey, if you go there, I think you have good success. Because at that point, I knew five people before me that had done it with the same success. And I've been recommending her now going on four years, I think, maybe even longer. And with one exception, which had to do with the, actually the law changed and there was some confusion going on, but it was all across the country. But with that one exception, that one person who later figured out that it wasn't the visa agent's fault. 100% have given me feedback saying it was a fantastic experience. So whatever, whatever visa agent you choose, the difference with visa agents is because it's their job, it's, they're doing it all day long, every day. They get to know people. Um, I knew a guy who did not have the correct social security paper, the benefit letter. Now it has to be a postile is different, but this was before that. It was a particular form that you were required to have. He didn't have it. He just had a letter that was sent to him that just happened to have that information. It, it, it was not an acceptable document. She contacted her person at the consulate 
explain the situation and they agreed to accept it. I was kind of blown away. But when you get to know people personally, you can get some things done. You can kind of work in the shadow areas if you need to. Well, from our standpoint, maybe we didn't understand something. We didn't get it quite right. That's a really useful thing to have access to. Visa agents have that. Lawyers will go strictly by the book. One thing is the lawyers, because they're not doing this very often, they're having to learn as they go. Even if they've done a few in the past, they have to refresh themselves. It's not current. They don't have any context. They tend to talk down to people, which causes resistance on the other end. So they're not going to smooth something through. Again, this is not every case, but this is a typical story that I've heard. I, I get feedback from a lot of people. They also tend to blow things out of proportion to make it seem more difficult than it was in order to justify certain fees that they're going to charge you that wouldn't necessarily be charged at all by a visa agent. Visa agents usually have a single set fee. Maybe it's 400,000 pesos, whatever it is. Maybe it's a million pesos. I don't know, whatever, whatever it is. And that's it. They have a set fee because they do this all the time. They know exactly what things will cost. So you have the cost of it. If the embassy is involved, there'd be a cost. If the consulate's involved, the visa cost itself. Translation, if that's an issue, that'll be an exact cost. It's a, it's a much smoother process going with somebody who does this as their job. And my visa agent, she'd been doing it for years when I first met her five years ago, and she's still going strong five years later, and now she's processing my permanent residency. So you wanna get that started as soon as possible. Remember, your free stamp to get into the country is good for 90 days. You don't wanna wait till the last minute. You give yourself some leeway. This process will typically take maybe up to a month, sometimes a couple of weeks. That doesn't mean you got two months to spare. Get it done now because you never know what might happen. If you made a mistake on a document, you got to send back to the U.S. and maybe there's a week or two delay. You, you know, these things happen. You know, kind of be careful with that. Now, if you're smart, you'll have run all the documents that you have by a visa agent before you come down just to be sure. Okay. So here we are, we're going through this process. You're getting ready to settle in. You're getting ready to find your permanent place. Your visa agent has scheduled your appointment after you got your visa to get your cedula. Your cedula is your national ID card. You need that. Now, technically, you need your cedula before you rent a place. However, here in Armenia, I know a number of people that will help you arrange renting a place with just your passport. Uh, it's, it's, it's not the norm. It's not even technically the way it's supposed to be. But what does it matter? You're going to have your schedule in a few weeks anyway. And, um, you know, it's helped a lot of people out by knowing people that can, can help you get that done. All right, so we've gone through all that. You're here. You're getting ready to set up your permanent uh, residency. What are you going to do now? Well, you want to start socializing. You want to start making connections. You want to get contacts for various services. As you go into a place, you have a good experience. Write down some information, a what's up number. Maybe even take a photograph of it and start cataloging those things. Don't, don't go six months later. Oh, I had a place that it was awesome. Where was that? Who was that? because I need that again. Keep Start keeping track of those things. It's all new here, where if you're back in the, where, wherever you're from, you know a lot of places, and if you're running into something new, it's easy to remember. But down here, nothing's uh, familiar. Everything is new. It's more difficult to remember because it all becomes a blur. So you don't realize it at the time, but you want to track these things. So keep track of good transactions, good restaurants, wherever you had success. Uh, taxi drivers getting their card, you'll find that doesn't work very well because you say, oh, I got a taxi, he was awesome. And, and almost all of them are here actually. But I got this card, I'll call him when I need him. Well, 
very often he might have a day off on that day, or maybe he's on the other side of town. He's not going to be able to get to you for a long time. It just doesn't work very well. Taxis are everywhere. And wherever you're living, like if you live in a building like I do, I go downstairs, I ask the doorman, you know, call me a taxi. No problem. He'll be here in two minutes. His registration number is 0694, <laughs> you know, or restaurants will do the same. Plus there's taxis everywhere on the street. That's really simple. Um, you want to meet with a doctor or at least know where a doctor is if you have some kind of emergency. You're going to have your uh, traveler's insurance that's good for your first three months. So that's good, but you want to establish who's accepting that. So you want to figure that out. You got you got some time. You got a, you know, a month or two to sort it out. But if there's an emergency, you want to make sure you understand that. Now, the upside is if there is an emergency, there's not much that costs very much. Everything is pretty cheap. A house call to my house by a doctor is 100,000 pesos. You can't even get a house call in most of this world. Here, it's no problem. Uh, when I was sick and dying last January, uh, she came to my house, uh, I think, four times, give me injections and medicine and check up on me and whatever. So it cost me, uh, for that kind of care and all the things that she was doing, it cost me the equivalent of about $100 to get me through that situation. I was literally on death's door. So that was all done in my house, and she just brought everything that was needed. You have to know who that is. Now, again, if you're working with me, I got a list. I'll recommend uh, somebody, but uh, you don't need me for that. You can go out and figure it out. I'm just saying, think about it and go figure it out. You know, so, you know, try to cover your bases with that. That's what I got. all I have for part two. The next one will be part three. And part three is going to be, okay, you're actually living here now. What are we doing? So I'll see you in the next part. If you stay on here right now, you'll see my horrible, poorly done promotional video. If you decide to watch that and give me a call for service, I appreciate it. If you don't, that's fine. I appreciate you watching this. And I hope all of this free information is useful to you. Much of it is common sense, but if I were you, I'd make an outline of the key points and follow it. I'll see you next part. Ciao. Hello, my name is Lauren Lau, and I want to thank you for watching my videos. It's my goal by sharing my life experience that you can make a good decision if you're relocating because you need true and honest information. And that's what I try to give you. The videos are free. Of course, contributions are always welcome cost money to do this. But due to requests a few years ago, I began helping people relocate beyond what the videos are. If you check out my webpage, grandcolumbia.live, you'll see here at the top, it says relocations. If you click on that, you'll see various things that I can do. I do Skype calls one-on-one. -on -one. We've set up an appointment. It says an hour, Sometimes they go two hours, doesn't cost any different. But I also can meet you at the airport, spend the following three days giving you an orientation, showing you around the, the area, and getting you settled in. Of course, I'll give you a list of contacts. That will be for movers, real estate people, doctors, things, house cleaners. There will also be names of locals that can meet up with you, give you tours. If you want to go to Salento and have somebody go with you, show you around, see how to operate the taxis and buses or best place to go shopping or whatever that is, I can set you up with locals that can help you with that. And they can also help you find apartments. My goal for you is have you up and running within a month. That's getting your cedula. That's getting your apartment moved in, knowing your way around, having contacts so that you're ready to go. The key is so that you can make good decisions without losing money by making a mistake. Back to the video. Oh, <laughs>